Well, good morning. Good morning. I got the lights on bright this morning. I didn't bring my swimming glasses. <laughs> Scott wants to see our shining faces. I guess. We're so glad you're here this morning. Why don't you stand up and join us? If you're joining online, welcome to Tree of Life, Belugarel, Texas. I just began to acknowledge his presence this morning. Hearts, we see the spirit. 
Father, we thank you this morning that you are more than enough. And Lord, as we declare this morning that we want nothing more, Lord, we know that you are enough. And Father, that we can trust in you. Father, being the one that we trust in and that we honor today, Father, we thank you, God, that you are the great I am. And then, Father, as we sang this morning, Father, you are our Father. You are our God, and you are the one that cares for us deeply, greater than anybody can care. Father, you are the one that we can call upon, Lord. And your word says that we, when we call upon your name, that you hear us and you answer us. And we thank you for that today, Lord. We thank you that, Lord, you are a father, you're a brother, you're anybody that out there father that sticks closer than any one of those father that you never leave us nor forsake us lord but you are the great i am yet you are the one that dwells within us so richly and greatly and we thank you for that lord we thank you that we can trust you that it's thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth lord as it is in heaven not just with this world but with us father as individuals that we can trust you that, Lord, you don't just have the whole world in your hands, but, Lord, you have us in your hands. That, Father, we are your children. We are the apple of your eye. And that you love us and you care for us, Father. And we honor you for that today, that you're a good dad. You're a good daddy, a good ever father. And you want what is good for us. And that, Lord, you make crooked paths straight for us. And that you go before us and behind us. And that we can stand knowing that we can trust you because you never fail and you never leave us. And we love you today, Father, not just because of what you do, but because of who you are. Because of who you are. We love you today, Father, and we thank you that you've called us out, to dark, out of darkness into your marvelous and wonderful light today, Lord. We honor you. We bless you. Holy Spirit, have your way amongst your people today minister to their hearts their lives we thank you that you are the great i am and we give you all the glory and the honor today in jesus precious name we pray amen, amen and amen amen god's good isn't he yes. he's a good god he's a faithful god and he loves us and I, when we were think, singing that song about him being our father today i was like you know so often we think of God is our father and he's just like our earthly father. God is nothing like your earthly father, okay? God is way above and beyond that. He is, a, he is a total different father in your life. Some of us have good fathers. Some of us have had bad fathers. Listen, don't compare him to your father here on this earth. You have a God in heaven that is a father that is amazing dad, that has all good things in his, in his heart towards you, and he loves you unconditionally. Amen? And he's a father that never leaves you, he never forsakes you, but that he loves you greatly and mightily. Amen? In um, Corinthians this morning, 2 Corinthians, and I wanted to read out of 5, uh, around about verse 17, 18, I wanted to highlight that. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Aren't you glad about that? That you are a new creation. The old one has gone, the new one has come. Amen. Okay, so we are new in the spirit. We have new spirits. We are a new creation in our lives, in our hearts, in our lives. And then it goes down to verse 20. And it says, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. Isn't that a neat scripture? We are God's ambassadors as though God were making an appeal through us. Really think about that. I was thinking about what is an ambassador? You know, I remember when I left South Africa to come to um, America, I had to go to the ambassador's office, the American ambassador's office, and he was the one that was in charge, and he would tell me whether I could go or stay, whether I could get a visa or not, and he was the one in charge. And he just ran everything, and he actually created my future, really, because he could say no, or he could say yes. He represented, and he controlled, he had authority over me and my choices, and that's what God has given us. He has called us to be ambassadors for him here on this earth. We have kingdom authority in our lives. Amen. 
we are of a different kingdom. We're not only US citizens or wherever you're from. You are now an ambassador and a citizen of the kingdom of God. Amen. Therefore, your authority changes. Amen. And um, an ambassador is somebody that has higher authority and he sends and he gives and he displays. And so you as an ambassador of Christ, you have authority to send, send and display and bring the glory of God on this earth. That's an amazing uh, authority that you have and position that you have on this earth. You are a resident, you are a resident didn't representing heaven you are a resident here on earth representing heaven and why is to bring glory to god amen? amen it's so that he can display his glory amongst us we are therefore first of all a new creation when you become a new creation you have a new authority and you come become an ambassador for the lord are you an ambassador for the Lord here today? Amen. I want to be. I want to be. I want to go and walk and carry out the authority of God in my life in this earth, bringing his kingdom here on earth. It's an awesome responsibility, but it's a great responsibility that we can have on this earth displaying the kingdom of God. Amen. This is not all there is, people. This is not it. We have life everlasting, amen? And we, have, we are going to live forever and ever. And we are going to walk in his authority forever and ever. We are just here for a season, amen? Aren't you glad we're just passing through? Yeah. Amen. amen. I'm glad I'm passing through and I'm going to be here forever and ever. But we are passing through and while we are passing through, we are ambassadors carrying the kingdom of God and displaying authority on this earth through him, amen? So let's be ambassadors for Christ wherever you are, in your jobs, in your homes, and wherever you go. And we, <laughs> I was at a, a store on Friday, and it was so funny. I was checking out, and the lady checking out, I said, you're not very busy today, are you? And she said, no. She said, it's because everything's so expensive. Nobody's shopping anymore. And I was like, yeah. And she's like, yeah. I said, well, you know what I'm going to encourage you to do is I'm going to encourage you to trust Jesus and vote. <laughs> and she looked at me. And I said, you need a vote. I said, and she said, well, I trust Jesus every day. I said, well, then add voting to that. You need to get out and vote. And I said, you need to vote according to what Jesus has in his heart. Amen. And there was a lady behind me in line and she got in on the comment. Next minute, she was telling me how Jesus intervened on her behalf. And off we go. And we're just having a little hallelujah, Holy Ghost time in the checkout. And um, then that, you know, I said, okay, ladies, I said, I'm on my way, but you have a good day. Keep trusting Jesus. He will supply every need. And I said, and then also vote. And they said, we got to vote. I said, okay. And don't forget to trust Jesus. See, you, you need to be an ambassador for the Lord. Amen. Amen. Even in the grocery line. Amen. So just encourage you today, wherever you go, let your light shine. Let God do things through you. Amen. Because he is faithful. All right, we're glad you're here today. We want to welcome each and every one of you here. It's good to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? Isn't Amen. it great to have Thank connectiveness you, with people and to come together corporately and worship Him and uh, honor Him here today? So we welcome you. If you're first time guests, welcome. We're glad you're here. There's a little form you can fill out on your bulletin just to let us know you're here, and we'll send you a letter. If you're online for the first time, welcome. You can click the button that says get connected and we will just connect with you. We just welcome each and every one of you here today. All right, so um, first thing on the bulletin is go ye is, go ye is not meeting on Monday night because it's a Columbus Day. It's a holiday, right? Uh, kids, don't send your kids to school. There is no school, all right? So Columbus Day Monday and um, no go ye class. Next Saturday, we have karaoke worship night. All right. Anybody want to participate in here? The, the info is in the book. It starts, I mean, the bulletin. It starts at 6, and it's going to be at the St. Clair's home. Um, please RSVP with them, and they would love to have you for that in their home. And then next Sunday, right here at church, we're having an usher and greeter meeting. If you are involved in ushering or greeting, please come and join that meeting. If you are interested in ushering or greeting, come join that meeting too. Um, they're going to give you, I believe, lunch. Is it lunch? Yes, there's lunch right after service. 
and uh, we're going to introduce our new leader that's over the ushers and greeters and we would love to um, have you Damien's still here but we're adding somebody to help us with the other areas so come and join us next Saturday I mean next Sunday right after service it'll be a lot of fun also um, we wanted to remind you that Mother's Day Out is meeting here and God's been good. He supplied kids, but we could do with one or two more. If you know anyone that might be interested in Mother's Day Out, Tuesdays and Thursdays from 9 to 2, contact Miss Kristen. And then we have a fun event for the youth coming up. That's October 26, not this week, but the following week on a Saturday. Our, six, our 316's youth group is going to be meeting and they're going to the <laughs> Gonzalez's home and they're going to have a fun evening with um, Jacob and Rochelle. They're going to have pizza, tournaments, s'mores and a lot more. So please, uh, adults, parents, get your youth there. We would love to have them and join in. It's going to be a lot of fun at 4 o'clock. And then uh, we want to highlight that Keep Families Fed meets here. Um, every fourth Saturday of the month, that's the 26th, if you can come help with that. I'm excited about this ministry. I don't know why, but uh, when Kim came to me and shared that she would love to bring it here on a Saturday, my spirit just really jumped. And um, I really believe it's a God thing. And um, if you can help her with that ministry, please see her. Kim Wave, right here. She would love to have people come with her. Last time they had lots of food. And the, the, the thing is, we need to get the word out. So if you know somebody that needs food, tell them about it, okay? And I just feel good about this. I think God's going to do a great thing. And then last but not least, we have Operation Christmas Child coming up. We're going to show a quick clip right before Pastor comes up. Um, we've got a few boxes in already, but grab your box today. And um, let's bless some kids around uh, Christmas time. And uh, let God uh, draw people into his kingdom through a little shoebox. Amen? Amen? Thank you. When children open their boxes, you can hear the laughter, the cheer. Jesus said, let the little children come to me. I want the children to know that Jesus Christ is alive and he'll come into each and every heart that invites him. The mission of Operation Christmas Child is to share the gospel with children around the world. Because we bring gift to the children, the mothers and the fathers accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. This box gives us a chance to show them that there is a light, there is a truth. Millions of children around the world are being impacted by these simple shoebox gifts. So we need to keep packing those boxes and continue to pray for the children around the world as we begin to disciple them. God bless you, thank you. All right, so your boxes are gonna be out in the foyer. Please pick them up, all the instructions are in there. And um, if you wanna hand out offering envelopes at this time, that would be great. We're gonna dismiss the youth and let pastor come up. Thank you. All right, you're all doing well. Hope you had a good week. You're a quieter group than normal. But you will be loud before I get done with you. <laughs> Amen. The ushers are handing out, yes, uh, ushers are handing out these um, offering envelopes. We appreciate um, you guys being faithful here as far as um, giving goes as well. Um, like Cheryl said, there's a whole lot of uh, things going up in price, and people are really feeling the pinch when they're buying things at grocery stores and merchandise and Christmas coming and so forth. But just keep on declaring to God that, Lord Lord God, you're declaring an inflation on provision in my life as well. Amen. Amen. We appreciate you guys being faithful in, in this place. Um, I want to say thank you also to you guys that were given to the Christmas tree fund. All the money's come in for that. We don't need any Amen. more funds for Christmas trees. They're paid for, so praise God. Give yourselves a hand. Um, two 12-foot trees coming in here. And thank you, Susan, for picking those up. And there'll be other decorators up us to decorate those and get them up here in a few weeks as well so uh that's a, a need that got met and also there's no service on wednesday night did you, did you mention that no, I did not. there's no service this wednesday night we're finished with the two series for men and women upstairs downstairs and then we're getting ready to go to um the vortex called the holidays as well so we're gonna give you guys about a two-week break here then then things start breaking loose for thanksgiving christmas holidays as well <clears throat> i also want to say thanks to all you guys who prayed about hurricane milton uh, you know, my sister again lives in Sarasota. My nephew lives in, in Bradenton. 
They were both right there in the eye of the, where the hurricane was going to hit. And um, the, even the weather people were totally perplexed. They said, we don't understand this, but somehow this uh, hurricane came on land sooner than it was supposed to, so it missed high tide. And because it missed high tide, the surge was much lower than it would have been. And so uh, there was no flooding at all at my sister's house, my nephew's house, the churchy pastors. There were some limbs and branches on the parking lot from the high wind. Um, there was, I think, about 12 folks I know of that died. Many of those died by, by tornadoes more than hurricane. And so we were praying for those families, of course. We started to see that loss of life, but it would have been much, much higher had that uh, hurricane hit full blast like Satan wanted. Um, you got to realize there's some very, very strong faith-filled Christians in Florida. And there's uh, the Hammonds are there, and there's other groups that are there. Rodney Howard Brown's there. Uh, Chris D'Amico's there. These guys were praying, bombarding the heavens, and so are you guys as well around the nation. And prayer really does make a difference. Amen? Amen. No matter what Satan throws at us in these last days, pray against it. Don't say it's got to come. It's going to have to happen. It can be diverted, or it can be lessened, or it can be weakened by prayer. Amen? The effectual, fervent prayer of the righteous avails much. Amen? Yes. So praise God for the prayer of the saints. And if anything else comes toward this nation, pray about that as far as Israel as well. Keep on praying for that nation as they're going through some real challenges. Um, we're having some birthdays this week we know about. Um, yesterday we celebrated Michael Wasson. Uh, his birthday is today. Is that right? So give Michael Wasson a hand. He's on, the, he's on the other side of 40. Psalms chapter 138 verse 7 says... Though I am surrounded by troubles, you will protect me from the anger of my enemies. You reach out your hand, and the power of your right hand uh, saves me, protects me. So God's just saying again, don't expect a bunch of trouble to be happening. But I kind of just sense uh, worldwide economics, politics, so forth. There's things that sometimes you see as enemies of your soul. And God says, don't worry about those. I've got it under control. Nothing catches me by surprise. And God's going to be your right hand protector through all this in your soul, your mind, your peace will not leave you no matter what these, this world goes through in politics, economy, so forth. Don't let it worry you too much. Um, and is Paul Lincoln here today? Paul, these guys are doing a whole lot of work. I know moving different things back and forth. He's watching online. And so James chapter 5, 11 says, we give great honor to those uh, who endure under suffering. For instance, you know about Job, a man of great endurance. It says, uh, fire came, let me get my glasses off this in a font that I can't read without glasses on, I don't think. There we go. Uh, for instance, you know about Job, a man of great endurance. You can see how the Lord was kind to him at the end, for the <laughs> Lord is full of tenderness and mercy. And so I'm kind of seeing here for Paul, you're in the um, last quarter of your life, as far as natural work, life goes. And God is saying at the end of your life is going to be a blessing. And you're going to see God's kindness and God's mercy uh, welling up for you in the last part of your life as well. No matter what, again, even things you're facing in, in this life, uh, as far as pressures go, God's going to have your back. I hear God saying that. Then we also have in the Pastrano family, we have uh, Jessica. Jessica wavered us. Is she here? She's turning what age? 20. Okay, so get, just write down for Jessica, Psalm chapter 16, verse 11. It says, you will show me the way of life, uh, granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of being with you forevermore. And so I really believe that God's going to start showing her more and more um, of his presence, his life, what his life is all about, not just here, but life to come as well. And God's going give to give her more and more peace also and pleasures, not just in the life to come, but also in this life upon this earth. I'm praying blessings on her for that. And also we have Isabella Ramon. Are Ramones here? Back in this area. But now we're sitting back in here. If you're watching online, uh, this is a young girl. And somebody's going to say blessings to her for her birthday as well. Anybody else having a birthday today or this week coming up? Would you wave at me if you're a birthday person? It's your birthday today? My son's tomorrow. Your son's first name? Lucas. Sorry? Lucas. Lucas. Write down Lucas tomorrow, okay? Um, how, what age is Lucas, Lucas going to be Seven. there? Seven. Seven years old. So tell him God Seven bless him and we'll pray blessings on Lucas here in a moment as well. If I miss somebody over here, as far as anniversaries go, this is the anniversary um, week. It was anniversary week last week. I saw son, James and son and Maria had an anniversary last week. It was what number for you guys? 39. Number 39, so you're getting close to the big decade. You got to start saving now for your Hawaiian cruise next year. Number 40 is yes. coming. But God bless the McMurrays. Appreciate them. They're a great blessing in our, in our church and behind the scenes and 
also been here for so many years, helping us out in many ways. And also Richard and Loretta Masters, you guys are, I think they're out today. They live up there in Salado. They're watching online. And so I think it's probably number 54 or something like that for them. Wow. It's in their upper, lower 50s for those guys. Uh, anybody else having an anniversary that I might have missed? Let's go ahead and have our ushers come to the front here. Let's pray blessings on these birthday and anniversary people again today. And uh, let's just pray blessings on the offering as well. And let's bless our city like we do every Sunday here in faith that God is causing this, this city to prosper and keep on prospering also. And Father, we do give thanks again today that you are relenting in weather patterns of God across this nation to help, help the winds of God to subside and damage God of storms to not be as much as they could be in the natural realm. We're also believing you, God, for a breaking of the drought over our, our city, over our region, over our state, and over the states around us that are going through this tremendous drought. We praise you, God, that this is going to be a week where the clouds come. And we say the clouds shall be filled with rain. And we say the rain shall fall in Jesus' name. And we praise you, God, in advance that you fill up these reservoirs, these streams, these creeks, these valleys, this aquifer, O oh God. We thank you, Lord, the blessing of God is here to bring forth rain, moisture, and water once again. We bless these birthday folks, O oh God, that this be a great year for them. Minister, God, in them your life, your grace, your love, your peace. We praise you, God, that all the things you have planned for them shall come to pass by the power of your spirit. We're also praying blessings, God, upon the couples that are having anniversaries. As well as the McMurrays, oh God, just bless these couples. That it be a tremendous year for them together. That they, Father God, fall totally in love all over again, one for another. And God, that they're going to be a godly example of what a marriage looks like. That's bathed with the love of the agape love of God. The Lord also bless what is sown today in this offering. We pray together right now blessings upon the city of Austin. We declare this city is blessed. We declare the leaders of our city's economy have wisdom. They're led, God, not just by their brain, but by the spirit. And we pray, God, that debt be broken off our nation, off our state, if it's here, God, any way at all, and off the people of our congregation. Help us all be wise stewards of all that you give us. We praise you, God, as you rebuke the devourer of thy namesake in our behalf. And what is sown, God, this day in this offering and this week, may it be more than enough to meet the needs of our congregation and those of God who also need help beyond the walls of this church. We thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God. You can hand those out again. The principle of the tithe is if you um, believe God with the first 10% of all that you make or, or have an increase, <clears throat> God makes the 90% go even further. And again, Cheryl in our church has an anointing, in our house has an anointing for machinery and our um, refrigerator. The ice maker broke down and was not working at all. And so she gets on to Google and spends about 30 minutes at least, nice. maybe a little bit more, trying to find what, what do you do when your ice maker breaks down on this kind of a 10 year old or whatever, eight or nine, 10 year old fridge. And it gives her some instructions to follow. She followed the instructions, nothing happened, still broke. And then she prayed and the Holy Spirit told her, push these two buttons. Amen. And she pushed the two buttons, first time did not work still. And so she said, well, I, I think it's, I did the wrong sequence. So you did them in a different sequence and now the ice maker is totally fixed. Zero dollars, zero repair man. Amen. That's one more little example of how the tithe helps God rebuke the devourer, uh -huh. thy namesake, in your behalf. Amen. And there's many more things we can say besides that, how God does that with this. Yeah, is Rick and Tina still in here? There's a way, but you're still, are you still in the place? There they are. Let's give Rick and Tina a hand because they have been uh, gone for a few weeks. Say now because it's just amazing. We were having our birthday um, dinner last night with the Boston's here. And uh, we're missing a, t a couple that the man died in a motorcycle wreck in Kansas City. He used to go to our church. And we said, also, I said, have you guys ever um, seen or heard of the Laramas? Because uh, they have been gone for at least eight or nine, ten years. And so all of a sudden, we missed their name last night, and they pop up in church today. So I told some folks here that I'm going to talk about the governor this Saturday. And I'm going to talk about Matthew McConaughey on Friday. We'll see who pops in here. So you better come to church and see who pops in here by us talking about them, okay? Right. Uh, when you talk about folks in good life-giving ways, they'll, they'll show up. Amen. So good to see you guys. All you that are newer here, God bless all you folks. And feel free to invite somebody out to lunch after church is over. Amen. <laughs> so I'm on this series now on strengthening families, number two. This is going to be the second part of what I started last week here. I'm going to go into something different next week. But it's not just for married people, though I am talking to married couples especially. I'm going to talk about this morning here about dealing with conflict, dealing with conflict. 
Um, last week I spoke about where marriages began back in the book of Genesis and how it was God's idea to display his beauty and his goodness by having men and women with families on the earth. We have a father, son, Holy Spirit in heaven, and they exemplify that kind of a figure of a father, mother, and son. And so God also mirrors that on the earth by us having marriages with men and women coming together, producing what's called godly offspring. Amen. If your offspring's not godly right now, be praying that they will be, because God's promise is, I promise you godly offspring. Amen. You shall be saved and your household. Amen. So remind God of that promise. You'll see how God can set ambushments for your children. They may not be acting so godly right now, but God's going to make them become godly as he works on them. Amen. Amen. So also either here, there are singles. If you're divorced or if you're a person as, as a widowed person as well, you also are here to display God's beauty and God's goodness on the earth in your singleness. Amen. Amen. Jesus never got married. He displayed God's goodness and God's beauty on the earth for 33 years. Paul was single. The Pope is single. I'm saying all these people here are people that are single. Amen. So you don't have to be married to be in God's will. In fact, Paul even talks about how the gift of celibacy is actually a blessing. If you have that, because it helps you have a one, uh, one laser vision type of life that points totally towards God's kingdom and toward Jesus. But if you have the right wife, right husband, though, you can work together and become strong together for Jesus also. Amen. So marriage is a picture of God's covenant covenant nature. This is why when God's people rebel and backslide, God does not call it idolatry. God calls it adultery because God says you're now married to me in covenant. If you break that covenant, you're committing spiritual adultery. So when God talked to Israel again and again back in the Old Testament when they backslid or got involved in demonic worship or idolatry, he called them and the prophets called them adulterous people. You're committing adultery with me and the same things found in the book of James New Testament as well and so we don't want to commit spiritual adultery on God may he be the only one we worship honor and adore amen. in this life amen we also talked about how the modern view of marriage today in most Western civilization cultures is finding somebody who will meet all of my needs and fulfill me also totally at the same time and we got to realize again that when you get married if you have a view or a, or a philosophy of that you're going to find yourself ending up in bitterness, anger, and disappointment because no human being can meet all your needs. No human can fulfill every desire you've got of your heart. Only Jesus can do that. Amen. So you got to keep God first, keep Jesus first, keep the Holy Spirit first. Do that, and then God will give you contentment with your imperfect mate. You're imperfect, and they're imperfect. Amen? And I saw the unity candle last week in a picture how the two candles lit at weddings, the one candle is the middle, the two candles come together and form one candle, but those two candles still stay lit because it's still two individuals coming together and forming one bond, but the two people don't die. They're just coming together with their own strengths and their own weaknesses and their own mindsets in that relationship, okay? So today is about dealing with conflict. Uh, Proverbs chapter 18, verse 37 I think it's on the screen here as well. New King James Version is the main version I'm going to read this morning. It says, um, the first one to present their case or their cause seems to be right until the neighbor comes and examines him. So it's always important not to listen to anybody, just their side of a story is what it's saying here. There's always another side of the story. I realized in my 21 years of pastoring here and also our time in public ministry and 43 years of marriage, there is always two sides to every story. Amen. That's why when people come to me and tell me how bad their wife is and why they're getting divorced because how bad my wife is, all of a sudden the wife comes and says, well, you don't realize what he does. <laughs> and so there actually is always two sides to every story. Now, I got shot down in the past, and so I'm, so, I'm not going to say to do this at all, but I still my opinion. That sometimes if, if it was up to me, she wants to shut me down by even now. Yeah. If you're going to get married some divorced person, I'd find their, their spouse and, and interview them. Yeah. Now, these guys, now most say, no, no, don't do that. <laughs> they just lie their head off. Well, there might be some little truth there. Some are saying it's my opinion, That's but I don't plan on divorcing Cheryl. So I will never put that in practice. That will never happen in my life. Amen. But some folks should just pray about that. If it ever happens. If it ever happens. So in my life, I'm talking about myself, but my birth mother and my dad, I was around until I was 10 years old when she died uh, close to my 10th birthday in March of 1968. 
And uh, they typified to me the perfect marriage. These folks were still kissing, hugging, smiling, laughing, never heard them fight, never heard them yell at each other, never heard them cuss at each other. They were always, just like every day, living on a honeymoon type cloud for the 10 years I knew them upon this earth. Just exemplifying the perfect marriage. And what's the mystery about that is they weren't even Christians. They weren't even, they were going to church. And they might have been Christians, closet Christians. I don't know. I can't, I can't judge that. Um, but I'm just saying to you that they were people that found what they would, you would call their soulmate, I guess. And they had this tremendous love for each other. Then four years goes by. I turned 14 years old. My um, dad marries a neighbor lady across the street, two houses down, who's a strong Christian. She becomes my stepmother with three stepchildren. And so when they come together, it's, it's not really like um, the Brady Bunch. It's more like fire and gasoline. And that, that happens a lot, I think, in step-parent type situations. And so there was one girl, once, my one older stepsister, I hope she's not watching online, I don't think she probably is, but um, she was a person that had a pretty bad temper, and my dad had kind of a hard head, and put those two together, it was not very healthy. And so we had what I call conflicts, sometimes till one o'clock in the morning, sometimes three, four, five nights in one week. And so I got to the point where I just would shut my door, lock the door, or I'd be putting my headphones on, listening to Boston, Kansas, or ABBA, or some kind of a rock group. Or trying to get some sleep um, when the problem was going on there. And so from that, I began to realize again what I did not want to ever experience when I got married and had children. But I also want to say right there, it's actually unhealthy to have a vision of what you're trying to move away from when you get married to somebody. You should get a vision of what you're trying to move to. Amen? Because many folks still say, I'm, I'm going to make sure my kids never have it the way I did. I'm going to make sure my marriage is not like my parents' marriage was. I saw them cussing, fighting, yelling, screaming. I want to make sure I don't have that in my marriage. Well, that's actually unhealthy to think like that. You got to put your, your whole marriage and life upon Jesus Christ, center it around him and get a vision of what you want your marriage to look like, not what you're trying to move away from. What are you actually moving to? You see, I've seen also in my practical life, of, I'm in my 60s now, I've seen several people that were raised in poverty-stricken families where there's always a lack of money, a lack of presents and gifts around Christmas. There was a lack of everything growing up. And sometimes the parents were just tight-fisted and stingy and so forth as well. And so when those, a lot of times when those people got older and got married, they made sure they did everything they could do to make all the money they could make in this life. They made sure they got the right degree, the right job, to make sure they had the right car, the right house. Those kids were bathed in opulence and money and things and stuff. Again, the most important thing about their lives. And those folks I know succeeded. Some of those folks are multimillionaires today living in mansions in different states around this country. They've got, they're driving the nicest Lexus around and they've got all the things they said, I'll never let my kids live like I live. They've succeeded in that, but their kids are not serving Jesus. They're not serving God. They're serving materialism. They're serving um, secular things. They're not serving the living God because the parents aim towards, I will not let my kids or myself live like that. I'm, I'm running from this bad thing. And God says, no, no, run towards a good thing. Let your vision be something that's good. And then God will bring balance to your lives, so your kids, hopefully, and yourselves will have nice things in life. Amen. But seek first God's kingdom first. Then all these things will be added to you automatically. Okay, so that's just one thing I've kind of observed in life as well. Um, many of us have never seen the healthy, godly side of conflict, also resolution, growing up in our families. Uh, you don't learn this in school. You don't learn this in college. You don't learn this sometimes even in churches. That's why it's important, I think, once in a while, we talk about relational things from pulpits in churches as well, because you're going to live with the same person for many, many decades. And also you've got coworkers, you've got uh, siblings around you and so forth. It's good to learn about sometimes conflict resolution as well. Okay, so now we're going to take it and we're going to learn about how do I live in peace with somebody that one Christian counselor said that you'll be fighting with the rest of your life. Now, the counselor said you'll be fighting with the rest of your life. I know what he means is there will be conflicts and disagreements with them the rest of your life. I can honestly say that Cheryl and I, I don't remember us ever really fighting. I consider fighting, raising your voice, yelling, throwing things, calling the dog names, uh, slamming doors, uh, going out for two days, uh, doing whatever. That's what I call fighting, okay? Uh, so we have had disagreements. 
And we have had conflicts. Amen. We've even raised our voice in one sentence or a couple of words, but not like a full blown knockdown, drag out fights that break and broken out in our 43 years together. Is that true or am I lying here? Yes. <laughs> it's true, baby. I'll pay her up to church. <laughs> so this counselor said you're going to be fighting with someone for the rest of your life. You better pick the right person because there's going to be disagreements. There's going to be conflicts in those relationships. Amen. So a close friend or a, or a spouse holds up a mirror for us. That's why God gives us a spouse sometimes is give us a mirror to look at and they'll show us ourselves. But sometimes they show us our warts and they show us our weaknesses and they show us the bad things about ourselves. All of us have those. And that's what can bring conflict in your life and your marriage is your spouse, your close friend showing you in a mirror some of the things wrong with you because all of us have something wrong with us. Amen. We're, all of us are a work in progress. We're all becoming more like Jesus. None of us have arrived yet. And so you can't have that mirror there that can cause trouble. So where conflict is done in a healthy way, we'll have the opportunity to grow in a healthy way. God wants there to be conflicts, but healthy conflicts. Notice the Bible, Jesus never ran away from conflicts. Jesus actually went diving into conflicts. He'd tell the Pharisees straight to their face. You guys are hypocrites. You guys are whitewashed tombs. He'd say things to them that are very, very hard. He wasn't trying to fight with them. He wasn't trying to get them mad. He wasn't trying to get revenge on them. He was trying to get them to say something back that he might work redemption in their lives. Every conflict Jesus entered into was to bring redemption to people Amen. and relationships. Amen. And the same thing <coughs> should be true in your marriage, your relationships there. If conflicts happen, the aim should be let this end in a healthy way. Let the conflict bring something good out of something that may look bad. Amen. So when conflict is handled poorly because of our brokenness or our pride or the stuff we're carrying with us into our marriages or our lives, it's going to drive a, a wedge between the covenant that God's forming with us, with our friends or our spouse. Amen. God wants to be healthy disagreement. So it's interesting that the Song of Solomon, which is wildly romantic, it's drenched with sexual type overtones. It's even almost pornographic to the extent that Jewish people, Jewish rabbis won't let their own kids read the Song of Solomon until they're 13 years of age at least. Interesting, this book called Song of Solomon is, is full of 20% conflict. How to deal with conflict is one fifth of the Song of Solomon. So I'm gonna be very brave today as the pastor. I'm going to walk through a minefield and we're going to dive into the Song of Solomon. <laughs> I'm going to be able to read it in a way that's not going to be in an in a, in a R-rated way or X-rated way, either one. It'll be PG at the most, but it'll be a way that God's going to show us inspirational things from Song of Solomon that shows the right way, hopefully, to deal with conflict. Okay? So we're going to see that as well. It's completely logical that there will be conflict in marriages because even at conversion, it talks about us becoming or being baby Christians for a while. When you first get married to somebody, it is a baby relationship. There's so much you don't know about women, women don't know about men. Am I right? Yes. Most of you folks realize that. Now that Cheryl and I have been married for 43 years, we're not the same people today we were back in 1981 when we said, I do, I hope. We've matured in some ways. We've uh, learned how to have conflicts better. We've learned to hold our peace. We've learned to pick our battles. We've learned to take and hear God's voice many times, let God fight for us. And God also has helped us even get some rough <coughs> edges off our lives to become more compatible as a couple. And so we actually even know how each other thinks many times and likes and wants and so forth. We know what to avoid in conversations in life and what to dive into. Amen. We know what each other likes and dislikes. And we try to avoid the dislikes for the most part and dive into what they like to reinforce that relationship. Amen. So that's helped us out a whole lot too, being married in longevity. And I can truly say that we both would go back to May 81 and say, I do all over again with no regrets. God helped us be the right, the right people, the people that we could be compatible with. And I praise God for his goodness with that also. When you first get married, you realize how selfish you are. Amen. When you got your first baby, you really realize how selfish you are. 
And so in marriage, you got to realize again, when the two come together, some things need to be dying and some things need to start coming alive that we're not dead or we're, we're alive and it's become more alive in that marriage relationship together. We also have the choice to turn into a person who's going to take either resist change in our marriages, relationships there, or harden our hearts and not change. Unfortunately, many people choose to harden their hearts and not change. They choose to be stubborn and rebellious and not bend and not get into the needs of their, their wife or their husband. Sometimes you can read in the book of Proverbs, I think it's around Proverbs 30 or 31. It says there's four things that are amazing on the earth. It says one of those is a snake on a rock. And one of those is a ship on the ocean. One of those is a bird flying in the air. And there's also a third one there, or a fourth one there as well. And all of those are amazing because they've learned to contour, contour themselves to their surroundings. The bird learns to take and put his wings out and go with the flow of the wind. The snake learns to take and contour his body to the rock. Amen. And so all those things learn to take and do some shifting and some shaping this differently there to submit one to another and get to their destination. Because the thing they have in common there is, is the bird and the ship and the snake are all going someplace and they cannot get there unless they learn to submit to and contour themselves to what they've got to go over or with along that path is also called marriage. Amen. You've got to learn to bend, be flexible, and be like the snake who takes and lets his body get all flexible over the rocks. Let's go dive in now to Song of Solomon. You can find that in your Bibles, your iPad. <clears throat> We're going to read in uh, chapter 5, mainly, in this uh, message. Chapter 4 before Song of Solomon is the one that's very, very difficult to read. It's not a little bit too erotic for most um, services, but five tones down a little bit. It's talking about Solomon with a uh, wife who's called the Shulamite. And Solomon has been gone and is now coming home at a late hour to his house. And his wife has locked him out of the bedroom because she doesn't want burglars or thieves coming in the house. It's not because she's mad at Solomon. It's because she wants to protect herself from things around her that might try to break in. So every night she probably, they probably lock the doors and he finds himself locked out. So verses two and three say this, I sleep, but my heart is awoke. It is the voice of my beloved. He knocks and he says, open for me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one, for my, my head is covered with dew and my locks with the, with the drips of the night. So this is what Solomon's saying there. This guy has been out hunting and he's been out gone for, some, for so long. He's been looking for feral hogs and he finally comes back at a late, late hour and she goes to bed very early because she is the Proverbs 31 woman. Proverbs 31 says the Proverbs 31 woman goes to bed early and wakes up even before the sun rises. So if he wants to come back home around midnight or 11 o'clock, whatever else, she's in bed asleep and she's locked the door for protection. And now he's showing up after the feral hog hunt and he has got desires and urges because him and his buddies are talking about some stories about women how fine women are and so forth and so on. So he comes back with some urges in him and says, I want to break in this thing here and see what my wife can do tonight. So he comes back and he says this, I have taken off, or no, I'm sorry, she says this, I've taken off my robe, how can I put it on again? I've washed my feet, how can I defile them? What she's saying is I have washed all the makeup off my face I've got no mascara. I've got curlers in my hair. I've got a mud mask on right now. I've got on my worst pajamas. It's got holes in them. And my feet are clean. The floor is dirty. I've got to get my feet all dirty again and get the sheets all dirty. Don't expect me to get out of this bed here, unlock the door for you, and let you in here. I have gone to bed. I am sleeping, and I'm here for the night. So Solomon has been out with these boys a long time, hunting, whatever. He's tired. He's sweaty. She gave up on him a long time ago, and she went to bed. He loves her so much, though, that he can't wait to get home and jump in bed with her. But she put up a sign that says, close for the evening. I could have been more graphic, but I decided to put close for the evening. Doesn't that sound good? That's better. Most marital conflicts are birthed from a thing called unmet expectations, unfulfilled expectations. 
Solomon has got an expectation of his wife. And his wife's not going to fulfill that expectation for him. And that's causing a fight. That's causing a conflict. That's causing a disagreement in their marriage. Let's read now a song of Solomon chapter 5 verse 4. We'll move on here. The woman talks now. My beloved put his hand by the latch of the door trying to get in. My heart began to yearn for him. I arose to open up for my beloved. And my hands dripped with myrrh. because She dipped her hands into some uh, Estee Lauder or something there. Some kind of cream. And when she started smelling it, I said, I'm going to change my mind a little bit here. I think I am kind of waking up a little bit. And so she gets some myrrh on her fingers and her hands. Liquid myrrh, it says. Puts them on the handle of a lock to unlock the door. I open up for my beloved. But my beloved had turned away and was now gone. My heart leaped up when he spoke. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer at all. What's happening here is Solomon said, well, I guess she's in bed, asleep, and I'm going to answer the door. I'm going to join my buddies at spare time bowling in Philadelphia. Go, go shoot some uh, pool, play some arcade games, bowl a little bit there, get me a hamburger, and I'll get back there at 1 o'clock in the morning later on. What are you saying? This is a conflict between Solomon and his wife. Now, theologians tell you the whole Song of Solomon book is about the love of Jesus for the bride. It's kind of an allegory that's there, but also it's a true thing that Solomon wrote down in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So it's a conflict between Solomon and his wife and how it gets dealt with. Uh, so here's some keys to write down now to healthy conflict from Song of Solomon. Number one, notice this. He only took what was offered. That's number one. He only took what was offered. What that means is she was not willing to do what he wanted to do. And so Solomon did not force himself into the room and said, I don't care what you want. I know what I want. And I'm going to get what I want. That's unhealthy. Amen. It is never okay to take from your wife what she has not freely offered to you. Amen. So understand that as well. Don't try and force your wife or your husband to do something that they're not offering to do for you. It's time to lay back. It's time to control yourself. Get your flesh under control, your soul under control, and wait for the next day and let the Holy Spirit bring in some resolve with this also, dealing with in the right way. You need to be a safe, available soul for your wife and for your husband. Not a tyrant, not a dictator, and not someone that forces your way on them. That's always unhealthy. Number two is this. He does not try to be the Holy Spirit. Does not try to be the Holy Spirit. There are many, many people, men and women both, who use their perception of common sense to manipulate or change the way their spouse responds to them. And so, remember again, this is called a partnership in marriage. We are partners together, amen? There should never be a thing called manipulation used in our marriage relationship. We should not use either one of us, either sex, manipulation to get our way. They don't exist to fulfill our every whim and desire. They're there to be a blessing to us as we serve them in Jesus' name. To try and manipulate somebody is actually wrong. Now, many evangelical Christians, many Christians, even counselors sometimes, or marriage seminars, they'll give you some stories that I think are really not really right in some ways. One of the stories is this. If you're not getting fulfilled in a physical way with your wife, clean the house and wash the dishes and clean up things around the, the yard and so forth and so on. And that will get her into the mood to have what you want out of her. Isn't that called manipulation? Yep. And then what if you do all that for your wife and you still have no success? Then what happens? You say, okay, I won't clean the house anymore. I won't clean the yard anymore. I'll leave the trash where it's at, and she can do it herself. That's what happens when you don't get your way. That's why God says don't use manipulation to get what you want out of your spouse. Amen? Try and be a person that does what God does. God never manipulates us to get what he wants out of us. God gives us divine agape love, hoping that somehow, some way, his love will draw us to himself. And we'll do things willingly, not out of manipulation in our lives. Okay, you need to ask God also to help you get to the soul of your spouse 
and not try to make things happen by manipulation. Find out what is really going on in their soul that they're holding back from you somehow, some way. I give you guys a story last week about Walter Henderson and his wife in Milwaukee, two pastors that are there, and about how God told him when, when she was shut down for months and months and was calling him names, making fun of him when he preached, and being a, a cruel, cruel wife in a separate bedroom, locking the door every night, and having no physical uh, things with him take place whatsoever, the Holy Spirit tells him, don't divorce her, give her flowers every day. Give her a love note every day. Bring her breakfast in bed every day. Now that was not manipulation. That was God discerning and God knowing the soul of his wife was, she had known only, but only abuse by men. Men had used her, men had abused her, men had walked on her, Men had done all kinds of evil things to her, so she saw men as pretty much evil and no good. And so God was saying, I want the soul healed in her heart. And to do that, I want you to start feeding into her soul those things that would minister to her heart and bring that a close and a healing back into her once again. And it worked. And she gave in, she broke, and now they got a happy marriage. They, give, they do marriage counseling all over the world today and also in Milwaukee because God's healed her heart. Amen. In such good, strong ways. Amen. Jesus never tells us, I'm going to bless you as long as you perfectly respond to my blessing. He never says that. Amen. He'll bless us no matter what our response is because he loves us. Amen. Doesn't expect you to always respond the way that you, you think he, he may want you to respond. God will bless us because God loves us and God wants to do good things for us. Amen. He blesses us for those reasons. So, Cheryl and I have been found, have found in our own lives. It's better to take our frustrations to God and the Lord before voicing them to each other. Over our 43 years of marriage, we do that. One of our contentions, we still put up today, this is a little bit annoying to both of us, is um, we got a window in our master bedroom, bathroom, toilet. There's a, there's a window right next to the toilet. And so she is a South African who's used to windows everywhere and the windows that are open. There's also a window next to the bed, her side of the bed. There's also a window in the back of the bathroom. And so South Africans especially will open all those windows up every single morning until she also leaves that Venetian blind opened next to the toilet in the bathroom. That means that when the light's on in the bathroom and I get up at six o'clock in the morning, the whole neighborhood who's walking and jogging can see in that window anything I'm doing. And so the distraction or dispute we have is I pull it down and go in the next five hours, just right back up. And sometimes I know I mean, sometimes I know it's gotten her goat, she's kind of mad about it because it's up real high sometimes. And it's her non-verbally she's saying, I want you to leave this thing up. I'm not gonna do I'm not gonna go in the back to the bathroom in the dark every single minute. I can't I don't want pitch black every time I go to the bathroom. You understand? And then also I realized that that window by her bed in our bedroom, everybody that's walking by the front of our house, driving by, can see right into our bedroom. And I'm walking out of the bathroom in my underwear. And I, I'm saying I realize that window is open. And anybody walking by right now at nine o'clock at night, whatever, is seeing anything, everything in the underwear. And so now I've learned what I do. I pray about it. I don't, I don't, I don't jump on her every day. Say, Would you please shut the windows? <laughs> I don't get mad. I don't fight. I don't yell. I prayed about that. And the Holy Spirit said, you asked for a wife. And I've given you a good thing. You've married a South African. South Africans want windows open. So live with it. Shut the thing. I'll give you, a, I'll give you a nudge. And I'll give you a reminder. Shut the windows before taking off your clothes. And so that's pretty much work. And so now I do, first thing I do, I go in the bedroom, I go where she does most nights. I shut all the windows, all the curtains, and then we do our bedroom stuff, okay? So I'm just saying, that's an example of how we have found it's better to pray and ask the Holy Spirit, what do I do about this in a peaceful way? And he brings peaceful resolves to that. And I promise you when I go home today after church, the windows will be halfway cocked open again. But I'm not going to say anything about that. I've learned how to get, deal with it. Amen. God many times rebukes us when you pray and says, you're trying to get from your wife or your husband what you should be getting from me. Quit trying to get it from them. They're imperfect vessels. Try to get it from me. 
It's also a good rule of thumb to always take your frustrations to the Lord before taking them to your spouse. And there's healthy reasons also to create sometimes a distance, but it's never healthy to create a distance to punish or manipulate your spouse. Don't run off to mother, to grandmother, whatever friends, to try to punish or manipulate your husband or your wife. That is not good news. That is not the way to handle conflict. That is a very, very unhealthy way to do it. Amen? Some folks say amen. Some folks say, say oh me. Say oh me or amen in all of this. Let's go to Song of Solomon now again. Chapter 5, verse 7 moves on. It says the watchmen, these are the guys that are buddies of Solomon. They're, they're the secret service. They're friends of his as well, probably. The watchmen who went about the city found me, the, the Shulamite woman. They struck me. They wounded me. The keepers of the wall took my veil away from me. Now, they believe this is actually more of an allegorical thing because in real life, anybody striking or wounding the king's wife would get their head cut off. So these guys, what they probably were doing was they probably were saying, you are a lousy wife. You've got a great husband. Here he is just wanting some natural things from you. You just can't even do it for him. He works his head off for you. Look at the palace you live in. Look at the food you've got. Look at the horses you ride. They're doing something there to strike her and wound her with their mouth. These are the friends of Solomon. You're going to find that in marriage a lot of times, the man's got friends. And sometimes they'll, they'll, through texting or whatever else, those friends of the husband will gang up on the wife whenever bad things take place in the marriage relationship. It's a natural thing that happens sometimes. So somehow these men wound her and take the veil off of her in, in, a, in a spiritual type sense. In verse 6, it goes on and says that she changed her mind and was now looking for Solomon but could not find him. So what she does is goes to his friends first, finds them first, talks to them. They just beat her up and say bad things to her, give her a, a whole lot of grief. And then next thing she does what most women do. She then goes to her girlfriends. Okay. So look at Songs of Solomon, Song of Solomon chapter 5 and verse 8. The Shulamite woman says this, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, that you tell him I am lovesick. Try to find her. So tell her friends, her girlfriends. If you find my husband, tell him I'm lovesick. I want him. Tell him to please come back. The next verse reveals what the possible danger of doing this is. Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 9. The girlfriends respond back to the Shulamite woman, Solomon's wife. They say to her, what is your beloved more than another beloved? O fairest among all women, what is your beloved more than another beloved that you so charge us? What they're saying here is you are fine. You are beautiful. You're the fox of the entire area. You don't need that scumbag. That bum's out there doing his own thing, hunting feral hogs. Should be with you, taking care of you in the house. What, what, what kind of a jerk is he? You don't need him. Just dump him. Let him go. So I'm saying the men and women friends both are offering bad advice and doing bad things to heal the relationship. Sometimes your closest friends aren't the best ones to go to first. When things are bad in your relationship. Say, man, you've got to get the right counsel, the right people. The mature folks, hopefully, are going to lead to redemptive things, not destructive things. So, can you see what's happening here? They're saying, hey, what are you doing? You're so beautiful, so fine. Why do you want this bump? There's always three stories in every story about marital conflict. There's his story, there's her story, and there's a the truth. I'm going to say it again. There's his story, her story, and the truth. Amen. What we want is the truth. The truth. Amen. Amen. And so sometimes even your friends, boyfriends, girlfriends around you, your own relatives can't give you the right perspective. You need the Holy Spirit right. to show you the truth of the heart of this conflict and how God can heal this conflict as well. Amen. So her response back to her girlfriends, I'm going to use, I hope, some Gen Z lingo. They were sketch and she was legit. Isn't that good? That's called Gen Z lingo. They were sketch. She was legit. And let's find that. It's in the Bible. It says that. Solomon chapter 5, verse 10 through 16 says this. This is her response back to her girlfriends about her husband. Let me see if I can find this here. 10 through 16. 
My beloved is white and ruddy. He's chief among all 10,000 people. His head is like the finest gold. His looks or his locks are wavy and black as a raven. His eyes are like dust. Oh, by the way, I've never heard Cheryl say these things to me yet. <laughs> I'm just certain messenger you might, maybe a little, 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 little bit. Verse 12, his eyes are like doves, but the rivers of waters washed with milk and fitly set. His cheeks are like a bed of spices, banks of scented herbs. His lips are lilies, dripping liquid myrrh. His hands are rods of gold set with beryl. His body is a carved ivory inlaid with sapphires. I need to hear that every day. His legs are pillars of marble set on bases of fine gold. His countenance is like Lebanon, excellent as the cedars. His mouth is most sweet. Yes, he is altogether lovely. There's a song about that. This is my beloved. This is my friend, O oh, daughters of Jerusalem. So she's saying, you guys just be quiet. This is the truth of how my, my husband really is. And so praise God, she has the truth. She says the truth and she speaks the truth out in this. Do you see what she's doing here? She's become an expert in the strengths of Solomon. Number three is this. Don't compare your strengths to your spouse's weaknesses. Don't compare your strengths to your spouse's weaknesses. It looks like this. You say in a conflict, well, she always does this, and I never do this. Or you say, I always do this, and she never does this. When you say things like that, it's apples to oranges. You're comparing your strengths to her weaknesses, and her weaknesses to your strengths, and vice versa. It's apples to oranges. You can't do that. What if we take all of our nevers do this for the husband and the wife and put those together and we're going to see that both of us are now imperfect vessels. We both make mistakes. We both have nevers. Amen. We both have alwayses and we both have nevers. We both have strengths. We both have weaknesses. Don't compare your strengths to your spouse's weaknesses and don't compare his strengths to your weaknesses. You're going to get apples to oranges every single time you do that. When you say, I always do this, never do that, you're comparing the wrong thing to the wrong thing. Number four is this. There are also times to bring in others to help with your conflict. There are times to bring other people in to help with your conflict. After she tells her friends how fine Solomon is, they change their mind and decide to join her and help find, her, find him. You can see that in chapter 6, verse 1. Read that yourself in Song of Solomon. And there are times to bring others in to help in your conflict. These times are, there, are mainly this. I'm going to write these things down. Bring in others for your conflict if the spouse is a danger to themselves or to others. If your spouse is a danger to themselves or others, bring in other people in your conflict. If the marriage is no longer functional or sustainable, you need to bring others into your conflict. If your marriage is no longer functional or sustainable, or if you can no longer live with the way things are in your house or your marriage, it is time to bring somebody else into your conflict and your relationship. It's time to bring somebody else in to help. If the problem is addiction, addiction will always cause violence or conflict or fighting. So your problem is not the fighting. Your problem is the addiction. So hone in on the addiction, not on the fighting, yelling and screaming and so forth and so on. Because that's just a by byproduct of addiction, okay? So if addiction's your problem in your, in your marriage, you've got to deal with the addiction. Hone in, that, that's the strong man. Bind him and you can spoil his house. As long as the addiction is there, you won't find peace in that household or that marriage. You won't be there. So the addiction must be dealt with first, okay? And so... I'm going to wind down here a moment. I'm going to say some final gospel counsel in marriage conflict found on the screen here as well. Some nevers, nevers for marriage relationships as well. The first one here says this, never respond to your spouse harshly. Never respond to your spouse in a harsh tone of voice, if you can help it. God exemplifies this himself. In the Old Testament, Jeremiah calls God a liar to his face. God moves towards him and loves him when he does that because God sees his heart. 
In Exodus, Moses tells God, you said thus and so, you're not doing it. God does not respond harshly. God responds kindly and draws Moses to himself. So I'm saying be like God when you can be. Don't answer harshly. Number two, never touch your spouse out of temper or frustration. Never touch your spouse out of temper or frustration. Don't grab their arm. Don't grab their hair. Don't kick them, smack them, punch them. Don't touch them out of frustration or out of temper or anger. A woman should never feel physically frightened by her husband. It is not normal. The strength that God gives a man is for them to protect and nurture her, not hurt and wound her. Amen? Amen. If any man or woman has this, because sometimes women beat their husbands up. <clears throat> Did you believe that? There are women out there. I, I mean, I got two sheriff son-in-laws. Women beat their husbands up. I'm telling you, it, it goes on. That's crazy. If any man or woman does this or has this in their marriage, something is broken in them and it's not right. And they need to get the brokenness healed by the power of God. Amen? Amen. So if in your marriage there's physical things going on there out of temper or frustration, it means you're broken or they're broken. And it's time to get healed in the name of Jesus mm-hmm. of those broken things. Number three, never seek to shame your spouse. Don't seek to shame your spouse. Have you ever been angered by your spouse so much you just want to get even with them and get back at them? Best way to do that is during Thanksgiving dinners, mm-hmm. Christmas <laughs> gatherings, when mother-in-law's there, when their sister's there, when their kids are there. You shame them in front of folks they respect or want to be held in high esteem for. You should not be doing that. You may have done this in the past and then stopped and thought, oh, wow, that did not make anything really better in this marriage. Shaming my spouse did not make anything better. It only made it worse. Amen. Jesus never shames us. Never. Next of all, never fight in front of your children, especially bringing out the past and including family members in that fight. Don't fight in front of your children. And if you do have arguments, do not bring forth the past or bring up family members in that fighting. You will teach your kids to hate your mother, father, grandfather, grandmother, uncle, aunt, cousins, whatever. Don't bring their names up. Do things in private, behind closed doors, or in a car, or whatever else. If you have a dispute there, and try not to raise your voice too much. Try to have a peaceful resolve with that, and don't always bring up the past about what they did years ago. We were one couple who was with us in South Africa one time, down there in the Cape. I first met them. Um, the man had committed adultery several times with people uh, he knew that worked around him. And so within the first two hours, I think of our first day with them as a couple, she's bringing up women he slept with, he went adultery with, and saying, you know what kind of man you are. You see, they're just shaming the guy. And that just really put a wedge right there between us and him from the very, very beginning. We shouldn't be doing things like that. That's called unfair fighting. Also, never try to win because we are partners in this marriage. If you think you win, you really lose. Amen? Because the two become one flesh. And if you win, you really lose. Because if she loses, you lose. If she wins, we win. That's right. If she loses, we lose. Amen? Mm-hmm. So make it to where we both win in Jesus' name. Amen. You're on the same team together. Last of all, never use sex to punish your spouse. That is unscriptural, unbiblical, and not good. Try to come into a frame of mind once again where you can come together in that realm and not be uh, mad at each other in that, okay? So that's my nevers. That's my counsel. Let our praise team come back to the front here. I'm going to pray of the congregation as well. And in conclusion, I want to say it's always good to enter into conflict seeking reconciliation and seeking resolution. Amen? Conflicts aren't bad. Conflicts are good. Conflicts are part of relationships, but enter into them seeking resolution, not division. Life is complex. Life is beautiful. Life is difficult. And all those things manifest in marriages. 
I said, but if we have Greg here and the pressure team is playing something here softly, think about this one last little thing in the Bible. It says when Peter had a conflict with Jesus, and it says that he denied him three times before the rooster could crow. When he did that, he felt so ashamed because Christ told him, you will deny me three times before this sun goes down or whatever. And Peter said, I'll never do that. I will die with you. And Peter did do it, and he did deny him. So Christ dies on the cross, rises from the dead, comes back in bodily form. Jesus Christ, risen Savior, and he seeks Peter out. Peter's out at his old job. Once again, he totally turns his back on his ministry. He's out there trying to catch fish. And Jesus graciously has caught fish, cooked fish, broiled the fish on the, on the bank. And Peter comes there, jumps out of the boat, and waits to him. He's so anxious to see the Shulamite who's unlocked the door. He walks up there and dines with Jesus. Then Jesus looks at Peter's face and says, Peter, do you agape me? We know agape love is unconditional covenant love. It's pure love. No strings attached love. I've got, do you agape me? Peter said, Jesus, you know I phileo you. Phileo is a friendship love. You're my friend. You're my acquaintance. I love you like a friend. Jesus says back to him, Peter, do you agape me? Peter says, you know I phileo you. And so Jesus looks at him a little longer and says, Peter, do you phileo me? The Greek language says, do you phileo me? And then Peter says back, yes, I phileo you. You see, he doesn't, he doesn't require Peter to come up. He goes down. Jesus humbles himself. Jesus says, well, you at least say, you phileo me. I'll come down to your level. He does that. We all know the story. Peter repents. Peter's broken. Peter comes back to Jesus. And Peter becomes a mighty apostle for Jesus Christ. Healings, miracles, signs, wonders, folks getting saved, writes part of the New Testament, dies upside down on a cross, martyr for Jesus Christ comes back full circle because Jesus would lower himself even after death and resurrection. He loves Peter. So Father God, right now where our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed today, those who are watching online as well, maybe there's those that are watching online, there's those that are here live in this, in this sanctuary, they're going through conflicts in their marriage, among their co-workers, among their family members, they're going through conflicts, disagreements. Father, we pray, O oh God, first of all, this day, be the Lord of our lives, O oh God. Help us covenant this day to seek resolution for all the conflicts we're involved with. Help us, O oh God, to put it in your hands. When our wife, our husband's doing things that grates against us, even on a regular basis, let us, O oh God, take time to pray. And say, Lord God, show me myself. Show me what I can do to bring adjustments, to not... Be so harsh against my wife or against my husband. Help me, oh God, to see this whole situation the way that you see it. God, to give thanks and not to curse was well, actually a blessing. I praise you, God, and thank you, Lord, that we are also those who will shy away from conflicts that lead to division in the body of Christ, in churches, in our families. As the holidays come here in a few months, a few weeks, let it, God, be a time of rejoicing and loving each other with agape love, unconditional love, because all of us have got quirks, we've all got faults, we've all got things that are called weaknesses. Help us, God, to overlook the weaknesses, Lord God, and say, I see your strengths, and I compliment your strengths, and I celebrate your strengths. When we come together, I want to speak life and not death. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, God. If you're out there watching right now online, you don't know Christ as Savior, I really encourage you to find a place today, even, even right now. Just say a simple prayer, like something like this. Heavenly Father, I can't save myself. I need a Savior. And I confess this day that Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation. I agree, O oh God, this day that Jesus, His blood, His death, His resurrection has paid the price for my salvation. I ask you, O oh God, this day to come inside of my life, come in my heart, be my God, be my Lord, 
Be my Savior. I receive you in my life this day. I ask you, God, take sin from me as far as east is and the west. Cleanse my heart. Write my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. I belong to you now, God. I want to follow you all the days of my life. If you pray a prayer like that, let us know by emailing us, calling us, texting us. Jack Adams has materials here to give you on what you do next after receiving Christ. Let's all stand to our feet. We have our prayer partners come to the front. Oh, wait, but we're going to have something else first. I think that um, either Jack or David has something first here to share. So I guess you guys can um, sit down one more time. I forgot about the end of the service. And then we'll come back and dismiss in a moment. Or let Jack, or let uh, Greg do that. Hallelujah. God is a good and gracious God. Amen. Um, oh, we're going to play. Okay, we're going to show a video. And while they're showing a video, we're going to pass out some offering envelopes. Because we're going to take up a love offering. This is pastor's appreciation. You know, the Bible says that. I've got it right here. Let me read it. This is Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. I will bless those that bless you, and I will curse those that curse you. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed. We have an opportunity to bless Pastor Mike because he has served the Lord with integrity over the years. And so I'm asking you guys just to bless him and his family, okay? Um, and we are going to watch a video. And do it online as well. Just put pastor's appreciation. The Bible says to recognize those who care for you in the Lord. So today, we want to take a moment to honor you. For all you do from the stage and all you do behind the scenes. We want to say thank, thank you. you. For praying that we would know and follow Jesus all the days of our life. For leading us through hard times into an exciting but uncertain future. For teaching us God's word faithfully, boldly, and practically. For equipping us to do God's work in God's way for God's glory. For caring about our lives, our friends, our families, and our futures. For being with us in our greatest joys and in our darkest hours. For sharing not only the gospel with us, but also for sharing your life with us as well. For showing us what it's like to walk well with Jesus. For being our pastor. We recognize you, we believe in you, we honor you, and we thank you today. the privilege of working with Kristen here in the ministry <laughs> under her leadership um, and I was honored to ask to give honor to her and the Bible tells us to give double honor to those in leadership to our elders I just want to whip out some scriptures that I wrote now for you because how do you articulate how do you put that into words <laughs> how do you put it into words so First Timothy, the leaders who lead well should be considered worthy of double honor, especially those working hard at communicating the word and at teaching. And Kristen really embodies <laughs> everything you could, you would think of for a children's pastor. She really embodies, man, if you guys just had a glimpse, I did make a video that we weren't able to upload Hoping I'll be able to share it later just to give you guys a glimpse of her heart and just the passion she has behind Teaching the gospel preaching the gospel to these little kiddos. It is 
it's, it's a, a real joy. It is so pleasant to watch you guys at work. The whole Sistrunk family up here in the front row puts everything into it. They lay their lives down and put these other children before them. They put those children's needs ahead of their own family. And I see this time and time and again, and even with the other volunteers, with the nursery workers, with the Mother's Day Out teachers, the Mother's Day Out children, I see this time and time and again. And I intentionally threw myself into that realm because I was like, this is amazing. You know, I came out of the world just with this combat gear, this combat narrative. And Kristen and the Sistrunk family, you know, had me pick up bubbles for the kids and chalk and, and crafts and painting and just all this silly, goofy stuff. And it was just so refreshing. And it was such a joy. You know, it really brought, brought me back to just being a child in the faith, being a ch child, having that childlike faith. Man, and it's awesome. It is an honor. So I put down here, Colossians, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. And they just embody that. This whole family really embodies working for the kingdom and uh, just working in the heavenly realm. Uh, they're not here in the, in the world just doing it for their own gain. They really have their eyes on Jesus and the kingdom and that inheritance that they're gonna get in heaven. And so I'm asking with you guys, now we ask you brothers and sisters to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord and who admonish you Hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. So she has really just worked through so many things with grace. The way that they handle situations where I'm like, I, you know, her, her and I are just polar opposites, but I've seen her with such grace carry herself through every situation here at Tree of Life, every event, every service. It's so graceful and it's very beautiful to watch. So I appeal to you as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings who also share in the glory to be revealed. She is a shepherd of God's flock that is under her care. She is watching over them, not, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants us all to be eager to serve, not pursuing dishonest gain, not lording over it, over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. I believe that you're gonna receive the fruit of your labor, that you're in transition to that season right now, you're gonna receive the fruit of your labor. You don't have to wait till you get to heaven for that. But I know what's waiting for you is in, in heaven is abundance, abundance from that. The ripple effect that you have in these children and the generations, the inheritance that you guys have in heaven, the visions that I get when I pray for you guys, it's, it's amazing. You guys are gonna love it. So I honor you and I love you guys. And uh, Francis, if I could have you come up, yeah. <laughs> this is Frances. She helps with the children's ministry as well. So she's going to say a word. Hi. My name is Frances, and I'm a member of the youth group that Jacob and Rochelle lead. Uh, during Pastor's Appreciation Day, the whole church comes together to express our gratitude to leaders that are dedicated, compassionate, and true messengers of God's word. And that is exactly what Jacob and Rochelle are. After our last youth pastors had to unfortunately move away, Jacob and Rochelle stepped up and immediately went to work to figure out how to improve our weekly youth meetings. 
they have been welcoming to all of the teens at church and have been extremely open-minded about hearing our ideas on how to improve our youth service. While it has only been a few months, they have already shown us so much resilience and continue to work hard to improve our lessons, community, and space of worship. They've planned hangouts with the youth on Wednesdays, worked hard so that lessons are relatable to their teenage audience, and have also already raised funds to refurnish our youth group, our youth room, so that it's more welcoming for everybody. And they also provide snacks for all the youth that are hungry at service. So thank you for everything that you do, and I can't wait to keep learning from you and strengthening my faith in God. Well, good morning. Uh, I'd just like to say a few words. Your body where I never do. Uh, I've been a part of uh, some praise and worship teams and have come across great people. But uh, I consider him uh, a little up there better than other praise and worship leaders that I've met uh, because he's not only a, a praise and worship leader, he's really a teacher that's, you know, clothed in a praise and worship ministry. He teaches us every Tuesday uh, about worshiping and about praising the name of Jesus. He teaches the singers uh, how to come in on time, um, <laughs> how, to, how to just, you know, uh, pronounce the right way to pronounce the song and, and just things that involve in this ministry. Uh, he teaches Dave and, and Mark uh, uh, where to properly set the notes in a song. And uh, he asked for patience and the Lord brought him me. <laughs> he teaches me when to come in, how to do stuff. And, how to give a beat right, how to not lag behind, stay on tempo, and all of that encourages me to strive a little better, to do better than I did last Sunday. Uh, and to, he just makes the team really gel. Uh, that's very important for a praise and worship leader. And uh, I, I thank him, I thank the Lord because I, I have a, a great opportunity uh, of serving in this a wonderful praise and worship team. And uh, thank you, sir, for your... Yeah. Thank you. So um, I'm going to share a little bit about Pastor Cheryl today. Um, you know, sometimes we have an unrealistic expectation of how leaders in the ministry should operate or... Um, how they um, are or who they are. Um, but Cheryl has sh spent so much time uh, just imparting to us a lot of her past and her personal life, and it makes her so relatable um, to us. So I'm just going to share a couple of things that kind of come to mind for those who don't know. Uh, she lost her mom at a young age. She... experienced a lot of rejection as well. <laughs> I think I should skip that part and come back later. Um, she experienced a lot of rejection in her life, and um, she also felt the loss of both of her mother and father figures, um, which is pretty difficult to, to walk through. Um, she's an everyday mom, just like a lot of us. Um, she's raised three kids and even walked through a life-threatening illness with one of them. Um, she's lived the sacrificial life of a person who works in ministry where um, her life as a pastor's wife is really under a microscope for things that she uh, does or her reactions to things that happen. And she even had to raise her kids uh, in a fishbowl where people are kind of 
looking and maybe scrutinizing about decisions that they make. Um, and so to most of us, that testimony alone isn't just relatable, it's pretty impressive. Um, but Cheryl is so much deeper than just that. Um, she's faithful in prayer. I was telling her the other day about a, a friend of ours that I hadn't seen in quite a while. And she said, how is her son doing? And I was like, well, why are you asking that? And she said, because I've been praying for him and I still have him on my list and I pray for him often. And I was like, oh, so isn't it so encouraging to know that you have such a strong prayer partner that is just agreeing with you in prayer on the things that life throws at you? Um, she's intentional. You know, when we plan ladies events, she's thinking of all the details that'll make um, the women feel celebrated from the decor to the door prizes, y'all, and even the direction of the silverware. Okay, we gotta make sure to get that right. She's a leader. Um, she delegates, she trains us on how to lead and identify leadership qualities in others. And she works to make sure that we know how to operate in our strengths as, as well. Um, she's a great pointer. Uh, what I mean by that is you can come to her about a situation and all the messy parts of life um, and she is exceptional about pointing you back to Christ. She reminds you of all of his plans for your life and the impact your experience are going to have on the work that you will do for the kingdom. And last but not least, she is really funny. Okay, guys? She can laugh at her mistakes, and she brings so much fun to our church family. And so for all the ways that you are a blessing to our lives as a flock and as friends, we appreciate you and we honor you today. Bless the Lord. I just want to start out by saying that it is an honor to serve with you, Pastor Mike. Um, I've, uh, I've been here since 2004. He came since 2003. So I've walked with this man for 20 years, and I knew him before that. We actually both ended up in Austin area about the same time. But I want to say to you that I appreciate your walk with God because I have walked with you 20 years, and I've had some fine men of God in my life, and... and uh, you're at the top of the list. You're, you're one of the ones that stays focused on the Lord. We all have imperfections. You made that very clear to us today. <laughs> I thank you for that. And I thank you that you have Cheryl to keep you humble. And I, I help with that sometimes myself. So I'm, I'm very grateful for that because our flesh can get out of line and we need to be humble. But we're all blessed because we have Pastor Mike because he stays true to the word. And one of the things that I really do appreciate about him is he... I'm going to say the word demand. He demands that we stay true to the gospel as far as this church is concerned. In other words, the gifts of the Spirit and things like that. So many charismatic churches over the years will drift away from that and no longer have that operate. He encourages you to operate in those things. So he, he gives a place for it to happen here. And I'm very grateful for that. But one of the things I want to say to you, brother, is... Because of your faithfulness to the Lord, because of the way you dedicated your, uh, your life to the Lord, the curses in your lineage have been broken. Amen. And the blessings have come forth for you and your family and all the generations that are coming beyond because the way you came to the Lord, the way you decided to walk with the Lord. And God really appreciates that. And I honor you because of that as well. And so, you know, the scripture that I was using was, Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, 2, and 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, Get out of your country from your family, from your father's house to the land I will show you. And that's what you did. When God called you, when he touched your heart, he, he moved you out and you said, I'm going to go. And I'm going to believe everything the Lord has to say for me. And I'm going to walk in this foreign land. I don't know where I'm going, but you're going to lead me. And you've stayed true to that. He says, I will make you into a great nation. And I would say this is part of your great nation, but not only here, all over the world, because you plant seeds all over the face of the earth of this kingdom. And God honors you for that. Um, and, and you shall be a blessing, and you truly have been a blessing. And I will bless those that bless you, and I will curse those that curse you. And it's kind of like 
When a curse comes on you, it means absolutely nothing. It just falls by the wayside. It doesn't have the ability to stick to you uh, at all. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed through you. And all the families that you have touched over the years have been, you've been a blessing to them. And we're really grateful uh, to sit under your leadership and the things that you have provided. And we're very grateful for that. Amen. You guys can come forward. Come on forward. We're going to pray over the offering. And this is a get to, not got to. So we want to bless all the pastors. This is not just Pastor Mike. We want to bless all the pastors with their finances if you're able. And as Mike taught the other day, and I also teach, you have to give joyfully. If you don't give joyfully, you might as well not even give. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not a burden it's a joy father we thank you for this time together lord god and we just uh devote this time to you and father we do pray over the finances that are going to come in we and we just want it to be a blessing father we love you and we praise you in the name of jesus and they all said amen, amen. there's cupcakes back yonder and back yonder both yonders you can say yonder if you're a texan um after service in Jesus' name. So you coming up? So why don't you go ahead and stand? Albert, we just put some music on. If I ask the prayer partners to come up, if you need prayer this morning, come up and pray with our people. If you need agreement, come up and pray with them. All right. And Lord, we just thank you. We thank you that we're able to come before you. We're able to walk together in happiness and in sorrow and lord we just thank you for all our pastors we thank you for all our friends Lord, we thank you for this group of people who love one another who love you lord may you be exalted this week may you be exalted this week as we go out into the world and we bless you and we thank you amen, amen.